Good afternoon. I'm Bob Millard, the chairman of the Cor MIT Corporation, which is our board of directors. Uh, welcome. Uh, this is a very special occasion for a very special person at what Paul Gray used to call this very special place, MIT. We're here today to give a proper name to this, to a place at MIT that I hope I'm the last person to call it the North Court uh, that has evolved over decades. Some of us remember it as a parking lot. You had to request a pass to use this place in those days. And I used to use this place um, to park my car um, whenever I came to Boston. Now I live here. Uh, I can tell you um, that the two hardest things to get at MIT are a degree and a parking place. Um, so when the, when, the, when the construction of the Stata Center and the Koch Institute happened, the restricted space that was this parking lot became a beautiful place. So I, I lost my parking place, but fortunately they didn't take away my degree. Um, in every season, you can see the MIT community cross this place from one building to another, from one place to another, um, or just hang out in this court. It's become a really vibrant part of our community. It's, it's kind of not a court in a way, in the way Killian Court is. It's really an intersection. Um, it's, it's one of the real physical centers of our campus because it's the intersection with the life sciences and engineering a convergence, if you will. And, some, and, and Susan Hockfield knows, knows a thing or two about, about convergence. If you haven't already read her book called The Age of Living Machines, I highly recommend it. It's about the convergence of life science and engineering. Um, so who can imagine a better next life for this court, this intersection, than to bear the name of the first life scientist to lead MIT, our 16th president, and my good friend, Susan Hockfield. You're going to have the pleasure of hearing from a number of individuals. Let me introduce them and and then, just very briefly, first you're going to hear Jim Champy, life member emeritus of the MIT Corporation and the person who chaired the MIT search committee that led us to Susan Hockfield and led Susan Hockfield to us. Next, Professor Paula Hammond, the David H. Koch professor and department head of chemical engineering. You'll also be treated to a performance by Professor John Harbison and the MIT faculty from Strength in Numbers, followed by the MIT Vocal Jazz Ensemble. President Reif will conclude our program, but not until after we hear from the great lady herself, Susan. Jim? Thank you, Bob, and uh, thank you, Raphael, for inviting me to, uh, to tell the story once again of our, <clears throat> of our search that brought uh, Susan to, uh, to MIT and the engagement uh, of Susan. You know, I've been asked a few times to tell this story, and as I prepared for, for today's, uh, really today's ceremony, I thought we might simply make a movie about uh, bringing Susan here, we'd simply call it Susan Comes to MIT. Susan Comes to MIT. And it would have two parts. The first part would be about the search and actually finding Susan. And the second part would be about convincing Susan that this is where she wanted to be. Although I have to tell you, I believe from the very beginning, this is where Susan wanted to be. She was just too good a negotiator 
to give us an early and easy yes. I do remember that. I do remember that. It all began in 2004 when Chuck Vest announced that he would be stepping down. And as we've done in the past, Dana Mead, our then chairman, formed what we formally called the Committee on the Presidency. It would be the, the members of the corporation that would form the, the search committee. At the same time, uh, Dana invited the then chair of the faculty, that was Raphael Bras, the, the chair uh, of the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, to form a faculty committee. And that faculty committee would be chaired by Jerry Friedman. Some of you may know Jerry. I don't think Jerry is with us here tonight or today, but Jerry, uh, Jerry was a Nobel Prize winner, as many of you may know, really an eminent and wonderful, wonderful faculty member. And it was such a privilege to have Jerry on the, on the committee. And we actually merged both committees, both the faculty uh, and the corporation committee, to act as a single committee. That's always been the MIT process. And it's a, it's a wonderful method of governance that brings the faculty and the corporation together very early in the decision about who will serve as MIT's uh, next, next president. Uh, during, those, during those discussions, the many discussions and meetings that we had, I remember the faculty would often move us to, to great debates and discussions about process. And the corporation members would get nervous. They'd, they'd worry we'd never get the job done. And then sometimes the faculty would act up. But Jerry always sat next to me. I'd nudge Jerry, and Jerry would settle the faculty down. I was always amazed at how a Nobel laureate could quickly settle the faculty down. Um, we began our work, as always, by gathering a large number of names. We would, we would ask people inside MIT, people outside of MIT, for suggestions. The funnel always begins in these searches with maybe 50 or 60 possible candidates. But I have to tell you, in the very end, and I've had the privilege of, of, uh, of chairing uh, two searches for MIT's presidents, at the very end, you discover that there are, in fact, very few people who have the, the qualities and the skills to be president of MIT. And the challenge is, how do we get, how do we get to, you know, to, to the narrowing of the very large list? Well, we, we begin, and we began in both searches, by, by talking extensively about MIT's opportunities and challenges, what we believe in as, a, as an institution, and what that all means for the qualities, the qualities of MIT's next president. I got that advice, interestingly, from Chuck Vest when Chuck was leaving. He said, Jim, don't waste your time uh, creating a job description. You'll never find the perfect candidate who'll check all those boxes. And we didn't. We didn't. We just, we just started to articulate and as a committee think about what are the qualities required of our, of our next president. Now, we had a large list. We had on that list the name uh, of, of Susan Hockfield, the, uh, the provost of Yale. We didn't know Susan. We didn't know Susan. Nobody on the committee really knew Susan. We knew her by reputation, and we knew her credentials. And we had a mechanism. It was a, it was a bit of a lame mechanism that we would use when we n sort of knew a, maybe a candidate that might be a serious candidate, but we weren't sure. So we wouldn't call them and say, please come and talk to us as a candidate. We didn't want to embarrass them or the committee. We would call them and say, we're doing a search here at MIT for our next president please come and give us some advice. Give us some advice on what we should be looking for. So I called Susan. The chair of the committee always calls the potential candidates. I called Susan. I said, Susan, we're doing a search. Will you please come here and give us advice? And she said, sure, Jim. By the way, I learned immediately about Susan's directness. But she then said, how long will we keep up this charade? <laughs> no, I remember that. I remember that. I said, Susan. It would, be, it would be best for us to, to, to end the charade now. We'll just, we'll just end the charade now, so please come. Kirk Collenbrander, I don't know whether Kirk has joined us today, but Kirk was the secretary of the corporation. They said, Kirk, send a car, send a car to, to New Haven, get Susan, bring her to one of our meetings, please. This could be a very, very serious candidate. By the way, in preparation for that meeting, I was looking for advice about how to really do this job, how to find a president. And I went and called on a, another emeritus member of the corporation, Carl Mueller, class of 41. Uh, cla uh, uh, Carl had actually chaired two earlier search committees in, in very early days for MIT's presidency. He was living, I remember, I remember visiting him. He was a retired banker living uh, 
on the east side of, of New York on the river. He invited me to lunch. I said, Carl, how should I do this? I've never done this before. He said, Jim, you have nothing to worry about, nothing to worry about. You will know when you have MIT's next president in the room. You will know when you have MIT's next president in the room. So of course, we had to get Susan into the room. I remember the setting. I remember the setting distinctly. We held our meetings off campus because we never wanted to see, the campus couldn't see who was coming and going, who we were considering for MIT's next president. So our meetings were all in Boston. We rotated uh, between the Algonquin Club, uh, the Four Seasons, and the Old Ritz Carlton on Arlington Street. We would have dinner meetings. The faculty liked uh, the Four Seasons because the food was best, the food was best. But Susan's meeting was at the Algonquin Club. We were gathered in a large conference room facing Commonwealth Avenue. The large sliding doors opened. Susan entered the room. The committees, and there were about, a committee of about 23 when you added everything up, were seated around a table, and the discussion began. We had a protocol for the, for the, for the, for the interviews. We had a set of questions that the committees had, uh, had, had created to ask every candidate. And the protocol required a member of the corporation and a member of the faculty to kind of lead in the questioning. We had someone assigned to do that. So that process began. The rest of the, uh, of the, of the, the, the committee started to engage. Susan started to engage. And it was an extraordinarily natural, natural engagement. We could tell that Susan understood the kind of institution we were. We could understand Susan. The, the conversation just flowed so easily that I think at the end of about two hours, and we usually spoke to candidates for about two hours, several of us in the room knew that we might just well have had MIT's next president in the room. We knew that, we knew that in our, in our first meeting. But there was a long way to go. We had other candidates to talk with. Talk with all of those candidates, we got to a very narrow list, a very, very narrow list. We had a student advisory committee, student advisory committee that was actually did very, very good work. We asked them to interview the finalists. They came back to us and said, Susan should be the next president. They had advised us on that. The very last meeting of the committee was at the old Ritz Carlton. I remember again the room. It was a long, narrow room. Jerry and I used to always sit next to each other at one end of the table. We went around the room asking every member of the committee to voice his or her perspective on all the candidates. And everybody was being very fair and very balanced. And it was hard to tell, actually, where we, where we would come out. These were two very good candidates. I turned to Jerry. I said, Jerry, do you know where this is going to come out? He said, no. I said, I don't know either. And then Jerry reminded me that, uh, that the faculty actually wanted a secret ballot. I wanted to show of hands. I wanted to see where everyone stood. So if we had a, a tight vote, we could kind of negotiate to an end. But Jerry said, no, the, the faculty wants to be private in how they vote. So Jerry and I quickly, quickly devised a process by which we would have a written ballot. Every member of the committees would sign his or her ballot. Jerry and I would be the only ones to count the ballots so we would know where, how everyone voted. But we had nothing to worry about because on the very first ballot, Susan was the overwhelming choice, the overwhelming choice. And I remember the room. I remember the room when the, when the, when the counts were announced. Someone at the far end from where Jerry and I were sitting, one of the faculty members, quietly announced that without having set this out as an objective, we were about to recommend to the MIT Corporation the first woman president of MIT. It was actually a moving and solemn moment, moving and solemn moment. But now we had to go and convince Susan that she wanted MIT. So I called Kirk again. I said, Kirk, I've never been to New Haven, never been to the, to the Yale campus. Get me a car. The train wasn't, we didn't have a train that ran there very easily. We didn't, we didn't have a, a fast train. And uh, I was a bit concerned about going to Yale, going onto the campus, because I was going to poach Yale's provost. That's what we were going to do. We wanted to pull Yale's provost out of Yale, get the provost of Yale to understand that this was the place for her before any other institution, including Yale, figured out that Susan could be its next president. And we knew we had to act. At that point, at that time, and I believe it's still, it still is the case, Yale had a home 
for its provost. Marty, we don't have a home for our provost, I'm sorry, but Yale had a lovely home for a provost. I visited the home. I first met Tom and Elizabeth there. I also met the family dog, the now late Casey. Casey's now in dog heaven. But I remember meeting Casey. Casey was a lively and wonderful and friendly golden retriever, as I remember. And when I met Casey, I knew we had met, made the right decision. We had made the right decision. Um, Greyhouse hadn't had a dog since we had Priscilla Gray's Corgi, and Casey was much livelier. The students would love Casey, and they would love Susan. We knew that. We knew that. But it was there that, that Susan and I first began a serious discussion about what MIT was. I remember having that discussion. What do we believe in? And we started to talk about things that we commonly talk about now, about meritocracy and excellence and the search, you know, the search, search for the truth. Uh, we could, I could feel the engagement. I could feel the engagement. But there were a couple of obstacles we still had to address. One, we learned that, uh, that Yale was paying its provost a lot more than we paid our presidents. And we also recognized that we were not only, we not only recruiting the provost of Yale, but we were recruiting a very distinguished faculty member and scientist, someone who had tenure at Yale. Now, many of you may not know this, but the MIT presidency does not come with tenure. We typically don't have that problem. When the MIT president comes from the current faculty, they usually arrive, as Raphael did, with, with tenure. But somehow, we had to get Susan tenure. Well, the MIT Corporation has the power to grant tenure, but has never done that without the recommendation of the faculty, has never exercised that power, and we weren't about to do it. But again, we had nothing to worry about, because graciously, Susan volunteered to apply for tenure, just as any entry-level faculty member does, submitted her letters, her work to the faculty of Brain and Cog, and sure enough, Susan was granted tenure. Although I do remember calling Jerry Friedman during that process and saying, Jerry, please call the head of that department and tell him how important this case is. How important this, this case is. Well, um, we got over that obstacle. Dana Mead had negotiated with uh, the uh, salary subcommittee or the compensation committee of, of the corporation to handle the, the compensation issues. We were ready to go. Uh, Dana called a phone meeting. It was a phone meeting of the corporation for a vote. I made the report of the committee. The corporation voted unanimously to elect Susan as MIT's 16th president. We were to have a celebration, an announcement in, in the lecture hall 10 to 50. I remember that day. The lecture hall was filled, floor to ceiling. People were seated in the aisles. Dana stood in front of the, uh, the gathered community, made the announcement, Susan, Tom, and Elizabeth entered the room, and there was a resounding welcome of applause, of cheers, and excitement. Susan, uh, there'll be many people today who thank you for everything you've done for MIT. I just want to thank you on behalf of that committee and all the work, and some of the members who, who aren't with us anymore, Dana and Paul and Henry, I just want to thank you for saying yes, if you will. And now I'd like to introduce Paula, uh, who actually, as a young faculty member, served on that committee, who now, as we can see, has, has grown to be uh, <laughs> chair of the Department of Chemical Engineering. Paula. As Jim said, um, we've grown, but we look the same. <laughs> there is such excitement on campus when Susan joined MIT, our first woman president and our first life scientist. So uh, when I first met uh, Susan, I wondered to myself what this learned neuroscientist, this distinguished Ivy League professor would do with all, all of us unruly engineers and technologists here at MIT. Back in 2004, MIT was already a thriving place with a very interactive and cross-disciplinary nature. If asked at that time what MIT is missing, many might have told you that we had already reached the penultimate levels of success. But Susan had a vision of what MIT could be. Susan had a vision of a campus in which energy-related activities and science, which were spread across campus, would unify to create something greater than the sum of their parts. 
that collaborative efforts in the important areas of every form of energy could be supported by a central core of research activity, student engagement, education, and even policy discussions, and the MIT Energy Initiative was born. Susan had a vision of the furtherment of our engagement with the greater technology world, including our neighbors, and she helped to usher in the expansion of small and large companies here in Kendall Square. Susan had a vision of a place where we not only educated our unique community of scholars, but sought to share actively in educating the world in a manner that leveraged digital access and new innovations in teaching and learning, and thus, in partnership with then Provost Raphael Reif, MITx and edX were born. And, at least for me personally, most importantly, Susan had a vision of the convergence of engineering and life sciences one that she shared with colleagues like Phil Sharp and Tyler Jacks. The bringing together of biology with chemical, biological, electrical engineering, material science, computer science, so that we could learn from each other and provide educational experiences to train the next set of investigators to address the world's medical and health needs. And this led to many things. It led to the Reagan Institute. It led to the Institute of Medical Engineering and Science, or IMES and it led to the Koch Institute of Integrative Cancer Research. I'd like to speak personally to the Koch Institute, as it is my personal experience with Susan in particular. The founding of the Koch Institute of Integrative Cancer Research has been an absolute game changer in the way that we approach cancer. And by example, in the way biomedical science and engineering is carried out on this campus and the greater world. By putting cancer cell biologists engineers of all kinds and clinicians together in a single building and creating a home for us to work closely together, we have been able to truly exchange about our science, discuss the critical challenges in treating cancer, and discover the incredible capabilities we gain when technology is guided by the understanding of biology. By bringing together this unique community, we have been able to uncover ways in which technological tools might be designed to uncover new and important biological discoveries. We work together across boundaries in a manner that truly involves not just pro forma collaboration, where the scientists and the clinicians and the engineers each stay in their own lane, but the absolute integration of knowledge across boundaries by investigators at every level. So to a faculty member like myself, who had just recently begun to apply my own engineering skill set toward addressing biological and biomedical needs, the Koch Institute represented the ultimate opportunity. I had spent the first part of my career working on fundamental polymer self-assembly and synthesis on design of functional polymer materials and materials for energy applications from batteries to fuel cells. I had begun designing polymers for drug delivery just a few years before the launch of the Koch Institute and was thrilled to be invited to join the team of engineers that would join the biologists to make up the coke. At the time, I, made a more, I had a much more naive and incomplete sense of the complexity of cancer and the challenges of targeting this disease of many diseases. Upon joining the Koch Institute, my students immediately began listening to and understanding more about cell biology and physiology of disease. And remarkably, my students actually began to learn how to speak biology and they taught me, thankfully. I witnessed the excitement of seeing engineering students and postdocs talk to biology trainees and uncover big ideas to address cancer more effectively. In that first year alone, seven or eight new collaborations were born in my own lab, many involving colleagues with whom I now regularly work and publish. The sense of discovery continues today. There are 83 Koch Institute faculty founded biotech com companies, and of those, 31 have clinical activity. The KI building has the highest rate of overall interim MIT co-authorship and the largest rate of patent generation on our entire campus. Ideas born in elevators and in the line at the Coke Cafe, genius bar sessions from engineers and biology 101 sessions from biology students, clinicians visiting and joining in to provide true medical context to point us toward the most important issues in patient treatment and bring an understanding of the reality of the nature of the disease. And so it is so appropriate that Susan's name be associated with this courtyard. Think about the interconnections at MIT that this courtyard represents. The Koch Institute here, 
chemical engineering there, biology, biological engineering, IMS, computer science. We are surrounded by the interdisciplinarity that makes MIT an incredible place to be. And the outward facing corners points us out to the world of Kindle Square and Technology Square and the burgeoning technology sector around it. Most importantly though, think about this courtyard. This courtyard represents community, our MIT community. Frisbees flying across the green stretches, babies in strollers pushed across by parents, dogs walking and running, students eating and lounging, tours of parents and future MIT perspectives, children climbing the red structure, faculty racing across campus for class or thesis committee meetings. This is MIT. And this is the world that Susan helped create right here. This collaborative space represents the many gifts you have brought us. And we are so thankful to you, Susan. Thank you. It is my pleasure now to introduce a musical tribute to Susan. Please welcome MIT's faculty musicians, Strength in Numbers, joined by Laura Grill J and members of the MIT Vocal Jazz Ensemble. Thank you, Paula. This is indeed Strength in Numbers, S-I-N, and the MIT Vocal Jazz Ensemble, Laura Grill J. We know that Susan Hockfield was a wonderful champion of the arts, and we know she liked jazz, and we hope that she will enjoy our performances of It Had to Be You and Red Top. Thank you. 
Good afternoon, and uh, it's truly wonderful to see so many of you joining us this afternoon, this evening. To all the performers, thank you for sharing your talents with us. And of course, to Paula and to Jim, thank you for joining us and for your wonderful remarks to honor Susan. I also would like to offer a very special welcome to Dr. Thomas Byrne. As Susan's husband, Tom, also served MIT through the Hogfield years with great patience and dedication. And Tom, we're going to need you again here in a couple of minutes. But of course, today, I mostly want to recognize our guest of honor, Dr. Susan Hogfield. As Jim explained, it was tremendously exciting for all of us who were part of the national search and the milestone decision that brought Susan to MIT. At the time, I was just one member of the faculty search committee, and I had no idea that Susan would later invite me to join her in the administration as provost. Susan, I will always be grateful for that opportunity for the trust you placed in me, and for what you taught us all through your example. And what was the first lesson Susan taught us? Do not waste time getting down to work. Months before she was officially installed as president, Susan set out on an exhaustive listening tour. It took her all across MIT. From the faculty, she heard an overwhelming call they told her that MIT needed a serious new emphasis on sustainable energy and the environment. So, in her inaugural remarks, she paved the way for what we now know as the MIT Energy Initiative, or MITE. Today, MITE includes hundreds of students, faculty, and staff across all of the five schools. It is an inspiring community pursuing leading-edge science, technology, and policy with a modest goal of helping to transform the global energy system. So launching a game-changing energy initiative, well, that was day one of the Hawkfield presidency. After that, Susan was unstoppable. With her perspective as a neuroscientist, very early on, she understood the significance of the rapid coming together of the life sciences with the engineering and physical sciences. She recognized this great intellectual convergence, and then here on our campus, she helped advance it geographically, too. As many of you know, Susan calls this spot the Great Circle. All around that circle are physical manifestations of the convergence she helped us recognize the Broad and Whitehead Institutes, the MIT Departments of Biology and Biological Engineering, the Brain and Cognitive Science Complex, the Stata Center, and the Koch Institute for Integrative Cancer Research. As Bob mentioned, it used to be a parking lot. But Susan was able to look beyond the asphalt and the food trucks to see a vision of the future. Susan had exciting ideas about creating environments that would bring biologists and engineers together to accelerate cancer research. And she took bold action, drawing on the talents and energies of people across MIT. Today, the Koch Institute stands in the heart of the Great Circle, a world-renowned first of its kind cancer research center. With engineers and biologists working side by side, the Koch embodies the idea of convergence. And it reflects MIT's finest tradition of bringing knowledge to bear on the world's great challenges. Paula gave us a vivid personal sense of how Susan transformed the landscape of research and education at MIT in the fields of energy to cancer. Susan provided outstanding leadership in many other areas too, from advanced manufacturing to the great community celebrations of MIT 150, 
from diversity to digital learning, and from Kendall Square to our global engagements around the world. Through her years as president, the world saw Susan's distinctive qualities as a leader, her brilliance, her unlimited capacity for hard work, her gift for seeing a subject from many angles, her ability to deliver calm, clarity, and confidence when the community needed reassurance, as it did during the global financial crisis, and her personal highest standards of dedication and excellence, which challenged all of us to be the best that we could be. In 2012, when Susan stepped down from the presidency, people crowded the campus to celebrate with her. One lively gathering was called Hawkfield Day. As some of you will remember, it included a fleet of translucent blimps, along with roving entertainers and magicians. Susan, I want you to know that I argued very hard to have blimps again today. But I was informed that having blimps in a tent is not prudent. So we're delighted to honor you with something a little more down to earth. Susan Anton, would you please join me on the stage? In a moment, we'll sit together for the very first time. Please join me. We'll sit together for the very first time and at this permanent tribute to Susan, which names this gathering space Hogfield Court. Please turn your attention to the screen as Susan Yu and Jesse Kirkpatrick, two of Susan's former first year students, advisees, unveil the plaque. We hereby mark October 4th, 2019 as opening day on Hotfield Court. Susan, would you like to say a few words? Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is um, amazing, totally amazing. And I'm just thinking as I'm getting ready to speak to you that uh, Dana Mead, who was chair of the corporation during most of my presidency, had um, many bon mots. Uh, but among my favorites, he said, well, everything's been said, but not everyone has had a chance to say it. <laughs> um, and after all of these recitations, I mean, uh, what I'm prepared to say is probably is, is a repetition of what many of you have said. But I have to thank uh, Jim, Paula, John Harbison and the, the students and, and musicians and, uh, and Raphael for these marvelous, marvelous and quite flattering and overwhelming comments. Uh, uh, Jim, I remember those early days quite vividly and I remember the first call. And uh, just to give you a little bit of context, the provost office is uh, different from the provost office here. It's in an old, very old building uh, at Yale and the phone rang and. I have to tell you, I was, um, this, should, this is going to sound immodest, but um, I was fending off interest in my interviewing for president's positions because they just took too much time and I wasn't interested in leaving Yale. I was very, very happy there. So I got this message, my assistant gave me a message that um, some of MIT had called and I remember rolling my eyes and saying, oh, ah. um, anyway, but Jim, is a remarkable salesman. So I did, when he proposed this ridiculous scenario, call his bluff and say, come on, what are you talking about? Um, and um, I'm really not interested. I think my opening game was, I'm not interested. And Jim said, but wait a minute, you don't know anything about MIT. Let me tell you a little bit about MIT. And this is the old days where I had you know, the, the, the handle of the phone part. 
And he said, MIT is a place that believes in the pursuit of truth. Now, while this is my fervent, deeply held belief, this was a time at Yale where you couldn't use that word without getting into a fight. So someone who would baldly say, we believe in the pursuit of truth, this was like music to my ears and a little bit inconceivable. And then he said something even more remarkable, which is that MIT is about meritocracy. At which point, I literally held the phone away from my head and looked at it, <laughs> not believing that, that someone on this earth could say such things. And so Jim persuaded me to come up for this first interview. But there was a ruse there, too, because first he said, well, you can come talk to the committee. I said, I'm really not interested. He said, well, just come talk to six of us. So I said, fine. And then the night before, the day before, I was, he said, oh, well, guess what? The whole committee's meeting. Do you mind talking to 23 of us? Um, in any case, so, you know, I didn't have, frankly, much stake in this game. So I got in a car. It was a beautiful day. Uh, I drove up to the Algonquin Club and, you know, sat down in front of these 23 people. And, you know, I don't know whether, it probably wasn't all 23, but at least 20 of them were wearing brass rats and they were all sitting like this. You know how people with brass rats sit. Um, so the conversation began, and it was amazing. It was an amazing conversation. I mean, I remember it as though it were yesterday, how exciting and interesting and deep and thoughtful it was. Anyway, got left to the, the room, got in the car to go back to New Haven. I called Tom, and he said, well, how did it go? And I said, well, unfortunately, it went very well, <laughs> knowing that our lives were going to change. So Jim, thank you. Thank you for being such a persuasive uh, salesman for uh, MIT's um, um, great gifts. So I, I have to say, I'm just honored beyond words by this ceremony, by the naming of the courtyard. But I'm a little bit embarrassed by all of it because I'm acutely aware that all of you who are gathered here, um, and many, many others who are not here, deserve all the credit for imagining the possibilities and delivering on them during my presidency. Um, so thank you, all of you, from the bottom of my heart and you know, from you know, my entire, entire brain. Now, there's a commonplace that says, when I say we, I mean, when I say I, I mean we, and when I say we, I mean they. And that could not be more true for my work at MIT. And I could spend the whole afternoon and probably the whole next week listing all the people who worked really hard and worked so collaboratively to um, make things happen at MIT. And they deserve my thanks. And I hope all of you know who you are. But even so, I can't let this uh, event pass without expressing gratitude to just a few people by name who worked most closely with me at the, frankly, very, very difficult work of helping a university, this institute, be what we all know we want to be. So first and foremost, deepest thanks to Raphael uh, for agreeing to be my provost. I arrived at MIT not knowing anyone, not knowing who I could trust, basically, who would be with me, who would be again me, uh, who believed in you know, particular ambitions. And Raphael served steadfastly as my provost and his devotion to MIT made him my most important guide. Raphael's integrity, his knowledge of and commitment to the Institute served me and continue to serve MIT exceedingly well. Thank you, Raphael. Terry Stone, who is here, I think, MIT's EVP and treasurer, who is infinitely wise in all domains, in a difficult time for the Institute, guided our finances through good times and bad, actually through bad times and then good, and uh, choreographed in a very thoughtful and inclusive way the future of our campus. Sherwin Greenblatt, who I think I saw today, also preceded her for, I said it would only be three months, Sherwin, just, it ended up to be a couple of years, but you know, probably felt like only three months. Um, and um, followed by Israel Ruiz when uh, Terry decided to um, go back to retirement, from which I had seized her. Uh, Greg Morgan, who I don't think is with us, had the remarkable courage to take on the role of MIT's first general counsel. And he magnificently designed, in a very subtle way, a new skill set for MIT. Jeff Newton and Barbara Stowe led our enormously successful fundraising 
even without a comprehensive campaign, but I would say kind of set the stage for uh, the incredible fundraising that Raphael has led. Uh, Seth Alexander, who we <clears throat> took from Yale also, I was at uh, one, one, one choice, you know, one draft choice, um, whose careful stewardship of the MIT investment portfolio has allowed us to do much more than we would otherwise have been able to do. Um, and Catherine Wilmore and Kirk Holenbrand are assisted me in the office. Running a president's office is com more complicated than I could ever imagined. And Catherine and Kirk both provided me with incredibly, incredible guidance. Um, Leslie Price, my amazing executive assistant who joined me at the outset and remains with me today, was marvelous in actually operating the office and frankly, um, helping with our always welcoming colleagues in the president's office. It made it a real joy to come to work. The MIT Corporation, a relationship that I didn't understand until I was actually you know, well into my presidency. The relationship between the corporation and MIT is critically important to MIT's excellence. And its chairs, Dana Mead, John Reed, and Bob Millard, have been constant sources of steady encouragement, guidance, and inexhaustible founts of wisdom. Now, as you all will know, um, I had a little joke about the presidency. People say, wow, it seems like there's a lot of work to do. And my joke was, yeah, you know, when I took, when I took this on, I knew it was going to be 24-7. I didn't know it was going to be 3610. <laughs> and those physicists didn't come up with those extra hours for me. Um, but my work often continued many mornings and evenings in my campus home at Gray House, where I relied on Catherine Lafarge and Muriel Petranik to help up with the steady flow of visitors. We had about 125 events a year at Gray House, and close to or just over about 3,000 people each year would come through the house. And perhaps most of all, I can never sufficiently thank my devoted husband, Tom Byrne, and our daughter, Elizabeth, for their extraordinary willingness to share all of our lives with all of you. So thank you, everybody. As, um, again, a number of people have mentioned, you know, to me, it's just particularly meaningful to have this courtyard chosen as the legacy of my leadership. Um, many of you have recalled what it looked like when I arrived at MIT in 2004, a kind of tired and crumbling parking lot, uh, not the most attractive place. Uh, and it was surrounded also by loading docks for all these buildings. But even then, the newly opened Ray and Maria Stata Center provided a hint of a different possible future. The direct line of sight between the Stata Center and the Koch Biology Building over there spoke to a very different 21st century campus. The David H. Koch Institute for Integrative Cancer Research replaced the parking lot and gave further expression of the emerging future promise of this growing convergence of biology with engineering. The Koch Institute completed the perimeter over there but at that time, frankly, we weren't thinking much about what this space would be, what this courtyard would be. And today, we sit in what has become a vibrant gateway between MIT and Kendall Square, the highest density bioindustry industry cluster in the world. And at this apex of the isosceles triangle of MIT's campus, you all know what I mean, um, we perch MIT at a major crossroads of the biomedical, biopharmaceutical, medtech industries, and more. MIT's sister neighbors, the Broad Institute, the, White Institute uh, the Whitehead Institute, and the Reagan Institute, extend our intellectual and geographical connections into Kendall. Now, when you enter this courtyard from the corner over there, from the corner of Main and Ames Street, MIT's great iconic dome sits in your sight, and it welcomes you into the world of, as Paul Gray says, this special place. The crisscrossing pathways that are, of course, now covered by this little village of tents, which is, I have to say, thank you. Where's Gail Gallagher and her amazing team for putting all this together? Thank you. Always an amazing event when Gail gets her hands on it. Really appreciate it. But these crosswalks, crossways, are always busy with traffic. And as Paula put up there on foot, they were on bicycles, they're on scooters, plenty of baby carriages, all reflecting MIT in action. The walkways link buildings, departments, schools, and disciplines, and facilitate what I view as one of MIT's signature promises. 
to turn footpaths of collaborations into superhighways. MIT's intellectual commerce represents, for me, the university's central purpose, to catalyze conversations and collaborations. Through the active contest of ideas, we invent a better future. And we can get to that better future only if we succeed in including lots of different voices, including those we're hearing today, raised in protest against what MIT has been doing. Now, I recognize that today's dedication happens during a difficult time for MIT. But if we include a wide range of different perspectives in the ongoing conversation and debate, we will, I trust, move the Institute in a wise direction. Catalyzing cross-currents and collaborations as MIT's president was an inordinate privilege and the most intensive educational experience of my life. And uh, need I say, as the first woman and first life scientist to serve as president, I felt a particular responsibility for paving new paths and setting new directions that would be welcoming to all. Earlier this week, in announcing a new fund to address gender inequities, Melinda Gates observed that, and I quote, a window of opportunity has opened, but there is no reason to believe this moment will last forever or that this window will stay open as long as we need it to. She said, I have confidence that MIT will continue to open and hold open new windows of opportunity so that, as I said when I was first elected to MIT's presidency, MIT can be the dream of every child who wants to make the world a better place and also the dream of every engineer, scientist, scholar, and artist who draws inspiration from the idea of working in a hotbed of innovation to serve humankind. I offer infinite thanks for celebrating my service, but even more importantly, for the extraordinarily great joy of working together with all of you to invent a better future. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Susan, for those remarks. Thank you so much for everything you've done for MIT. And thank you to our project team, John Alvarez, Dick Amster, Camille Battisi, Paul, uh, Paul Murphy, Laura Tenney, John Seeley, Russell Brown. Thank you to everyone for joining us uh, in this celebration. I look forward to seeing you at the reception adjacent to this tent following our ceremony. Before we conclude, I'm delighted to welcome back our marvelous musicians, our MIT performers, uh, let me invite uh, Professor Harbison to say um, to say a few words of introduction to our finale. Our finale. Thank you for letting me talk to you. Very few words. This is a little encore. Some of you remember the 150th anniversary of MIT, uh, which is under Susan's watch, and. Uh, we presented at that time an arrangement of the MIT school song. Uh, we're about to uh, trick your memories with a, a slim fast version of that uh, arrangement uh, with the forces you see here. It, it has a sing-along built on to the end. Those of you who know the words, uh, you will, so you'll join in. Uh, towards the end, we'll give you a little nod. Uh, so here it is, in praise. In the, in the old refurbished arrangement.
beckons unto thee And life is full and rich Arise, all ye of MIT And raise your glass on high 